Dear spectators, dear participants to the RNI days, dear panelists, welcome to this afternoon session on the mission on adaptation to climate change. I will guide you through uh, this afternoon, uh, uh, to this session in this afternoon. And um, um, first, a couple of um, uh, technical information. Those of you who are joining us online, you will be uh, able to participate in a survey uh, through a tool called Slido. And you see right now on your screen uh, how to join it. Either you scan the QR code, and then you will end up on that site where you will then be able to uh, reply to a couple of, to vote on a couple of questions, or you use the uh, you go to the site and use the the hashtag that is indicated there. And before I give the floor to the to the panelists um, in in that uh, panel today on the mission on adaptation to climate change, I'll explain in a little bit. Uh, to all of you what that mission is. Um, it's one of the five missions, a new tool of the Horizon Europe uh, framework program. Um, and this mission is about adaptation to climate change. And if there were only two things that, or no, three words that you are, uh, that you would like to remind from this session from and from the mission on adaptation to climate change, it's bridge, it's acceleration, and it's regions. This mission is about bridging the world of science and innovation with the world of those who need to implement adaptation actions on the ground. And the second key word, acceleration. So we want to help the regions by linking them into the newest knowledge and into the newest research, into the newest innovation, helping them actually getting the actions done on the ground and accelerating those actions. Accelerating both because we will have a little bit of money that we can provide to them, so we hope that this kicks off uh, certain actions, and also accelerating because we link it uh, to, to, the, to the researchers and to, to new knowledge. And that together, we hope, will kickstart, um, the, will, will accelerate, will help the regions in, uh, in uh, adapting, uh, taking the necessary actions uh, on the ground to adapting their regions. And why we are addressing regions, it's because regions, cities, municipalities are those who actually need to undertake actions on the ground. They are not the ones who uh, make the rules. This is the national level, this is the European level, but they are the ones who actually need to take action. And that's why we are having this, action, this mission to particularly help them in their endeavor. And uh, so the panel today is about, and when you want to do this, such a mission, what is it that we need to pay attention to? What are the success factors uh, for such a, a mission uh, to succeed? Um, and um, um, with that, I would actually like to give the floor very soon uh, to the first panelist. But I think we should put up the uh, Slido uh, question now so that the, um, the, the poll so we are asking you as well. We're asking the panelists that question. We're asking you out there that same question. What is most important for successful climate adaptation and a successful mission on adaptation? And you have uh, a couple of minutes to reply to this. In the meantime, I will give the floor to our first panelist. And uh, our first panelist is Svetlana Zhekova. And I am absolutely thrilled to have you on the panel because you will help us as a member of our new mission board, and we will have our first inaugural meeting tomorrow. Thank you very much for doing that. Um, Thank you very much, Johannes, <laughs> for giving me this opportunity to liaise with the people, although uh, quite uh, on online uh, again. Uh, but still, there will be more, I suppose. There will be more, indeed. You have been uh, a short while Minister for Environment, and you are a climate and environment expert. Uh, you are also have experience with regions. Um, and um, so in that uh, respect, I'm asking you, what is it what, that you think, what are the most important challenges, what is it we need to pay really attention to, to make the mission a success? Well, maybe we can first see the results from uh, the Slido uh, answers of the audience in order to comment it, but while they are being, okay, they're being yeah, they will they now will, display it. They will more and more reply. Indeed. There will be more and more reply. Maybe, uh, maybe in the meantime. Go ahead. Yeah. While they are yes, I can I can just share what I think about this. You know, we we have uh, here in the interactive uh, question session on slide we have a multiple choice, 
And uh, if I was to just go there now and answer these, uh, these questions, I would uh, definitely hit all four of them as, uh, as a success factors. Why? Uh, yes, all four. But why? Because to be successful, of course, first we need to know. And not only to know, but also to understand the risks of climate change. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, with uh, the unprecedented uh, risks that we have witnessed and also experienced in the last years, we grew to know, more or less, also uh, a little bit on the, on the hard part, I, in the hard way, I would say, but we grew to know. Okay, also we have the, uh, the science evidence more and more coming into our knowledge, so we grew to know. But once we know and we understand the risks, then what shall we do? We should find solutions and we should deploy them. There are also solutions, quite a lot of solutions also provided by science with evidence-based uh, experiments, etc. So there are solutions, but uh, some of these solutions, by the way, are quite uh, low uh, hanging fruits. What we need to do is to pick them up and to deploy them. So here comes the second success factor, deploy, as you rightly said in, in your introduction. And here comes the engagement of the citizens, because without engaging the people and without making really the solutions as part of their everyday life, there will be no success story. Climate change is leaving no one behind in the risks and in the hazards. So I believe that no one should be left behind and everybody should be made part of the solution. So here comes the engagement. And last but not least, the regions. If we don't engage the people, we cannot really make synergies in the actions between the regions because what are the regions? They are people. So all this success factors should work in synergy. And here to answer your direct questions, what would be the biggest challenge for our mission, but for any mission that wants to be a success, I believe that making a synergies between these factors is really what will be the biggest challenge. And this is where we need to put our efforts in order to be a success. This right. is what I think and uh, probably uh, probably the, the questions, uh, the answers to the questions by the audience will, uh, uh, will show more or less the same thinking. Let's see. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Svetlana. Um, we, uh, you have brought up already two other uh, aspects, the citizen engagement and the, and the regions, and uh, we will uh, deepen that aspect a little bit more with, uh, f uh, with uh, the, the other panelists today. And, um, and uh, we see now that the uh, spectators, uh, those that are listening to us, uh, they have um, the identification and deployment of their activists, those that listen to us. They are clearly want to get things done and uh, they say this is, um, and it is, is very much in line with what you were saying. So really get it, get it, get it off, uh, get it done. And uh, that is half of you uh, think that this is what we need to focus on. That's great to hear. And um, I will now give the floor to the next, uh, or actually out of the screen, to the next uh, participant that is uh, Audrey Linkenheld, um, who joins us uh, on um, remotely uh, via video conference. Uh, Audrey is the Vice President of Climate Ecology uh, of Lille Metropole. And um, to me, I think uh, you are an ideal uh, panelist, uh, Audrey, to talk about how can regions and local authorities, that is what you also represent here, how can you contribute to the success of the mission? Audrey, please. Thank you, good afternoon. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure if I'm ideal or if my, my territory is a, an ideal example, but uh, I agree on the, the answers of uh, the Slido. I think the What's important for us uh, on the local level is to act and uh, so to identify solutions and most of all to deploy the, the solutions. Uh, we are in a, in a panel of uh, the research and innovation days and uh, 
people who work in innovation know that it's easier to make a demonstrator than to deploy uh, at a higher level the solution of this, demonst uh, this uh, demonstrator. And I think that's uh, uh, also what uh, our local authorities are looking for. Uh, Lille Metropole, maybe I can say a few words on it, is um, um, uh, a territory made of uh, 95, to uh, 95 towns. We have more than 1 million citizens. Uh, we are in charge of uh, transport, housing, energy, economy, public space, roads, uh, urban planning, uh, water, city policy. Uh, and what's uh, specific and maybe makes us a good as example is that we are very mixed territory because we have some big towns uh, like Lille. I'm also elected uh, in Lille, which is more than 230,000 inhabitants. And we have lots, lots of small towns, villages, which have less than 2,000 inhabitants. And so we have to act on adaptation and climate change on the, the higher level of the metropolis and on the lower level of these small towns and, and villages. And we have to engage all the actors, uh, the, the civil society and the, the, the citizens in our uh, climate change plan, because we have one. Uh, we have uh, uh, voted uh, last year in, in 2021, uh, a climate change for our metropolis which of course uh, works on um, mitigation, but also on adaptation. We know what are the vulnerabilities of our, of our territory. It's uh, for instance, uh, uh, problems on water quality, but not only on quality, also on quantity. We have uh, water scarcity. We have problems with uh, floods. We also have uh, problems with, with the heat waves. And uh, we had a, a specific warm summer with uh, lots of heat waves and, uh, and a big um, heat island effect in our, in our territory uh, because uh, it's, um, it's a big territory, but we have uh, the half of this uh, territory, which is very urbanized and there is a strong heat island effect. And on the other hand, we have the, the other half of our territory, which is very ag agricultural. So uh, we are uh, lacking of uh, natural spaces. We don't have any or not uh, enough forests, for instance. So heat is, uh, is a problem when it's uh, getting higher. And uh, we, as I just said, have, of course, uh, a strong vulnerability in our environment because of this uh, strong agricultural environment and this lack of natural environments. Um, so adaptation is for us uh, 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 an important issue. We are trying to work on it uh, with, uh, for instance, uh, nature-based solutions. Uh, we're making it on, on water, for instance, working on flood management or resource preservation, uh, stormwater management. We are working on green infrastructures, uh, working on biodiversity corridors, uh, uh, trees planting, how to develop great parks, uh, how to make better soils for our agriculture, uh, how to make uh, sure that uh, all the citizens of our big territory have green spaces near to them, not only those who are uh, in the small villages, but also those who are in our uh, cities in the, in, the, in the urban center. Audrey, I must ask yes. you, unfortunately, that you have to come to a conclusion or to, <laughs> I have to, we have a very strict schedule. Sorry for that. No, I just wanted to say that uh, uh, the the adaptation, this mission on adaptation is uh, is uh, very important to us because it's uh, it's an issue we have to tackle, and we, uh, as uh, the slide said, we we need not only to to uh, do some demonstrators to innovate on 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 some uh, isolated examples, but we need to identify and to deploy the solutions, and we are very keen to to be here in this uh, mission and to look uh, on, on what others are doing on this. Audrey, thank you very much. You confirm again, deploy and not only demonstrate. Thank you, great. Um, our next panelist is Guido Schmidt.
Uh, Guido Schmidt is already uh, actually involved in the mission. He is a coordinator of the Resilience Project, uh, is one of the four already running uh, projects uh, in the mission. Uh, and Guido, um, you are um, the one uh, who um, we would like to ask, uh, what do you think, how, how, how will the citizen engagement help the mission? What, what, is, what is important about that in the mission? I, mean, I, I believe citizen engagement is fundamental. So I'm very disappointed that it ranked last in the in the Slido. Oh. I, mean, I would say, I mean, solutions. We know already a lot about solutions. There are many sol many solutions from previous projects, life projects, climate adapt. So if it's only about the knowledge of the solution, that's done. So I think one of the challenges is to engage citizens that they are aware, that they are aware about the problems which are there, the, ch the risks they face, and that they get engaged into, into developing the solutions forward. Mm. And the other issue with the, with the solutions is, I mean, it's very easy to put a solution in place, but you, if maybe you haven't understood the problem or the risk. So if you go too fast with the solutions, then you might have a problem before when you start, and then you do a sort of maladaptation. Mm. Citizens are important. I mean, we shouldn't be developing any solutions without engaging them. Uh, that's nowadays called the co-creation, but I think, I I mean, there have been many other terms before, and I think it's, it's really, really important to engage. But them. do you think that they can be important, in, especially in that aspect that now Audrey also confirmed, uh, namely the real deployment? Is it not there where they maybe play that important role? So to, to yes? Yeah, I mean, I've seen projects where at the end, I mean, if you're a planner or a politician, you have to go with a citizen and with a land user, for example, on site, and you have to say, okay, where the where the green area will go along, it's from here to there, and then mm. everybody knows what you're talking about. I mean, very often the plans, they are very abstract, people don't understand it. I mean, they see it on the plans, but who knows how to handle a plan, and even now with all the Google Maps tools which we have, so we don't have to worry about understanding the landscape our own. Citizens shall be engaged in co-creation, citizens shall raise their voice, their concerns, and the risk they face to the pol to the decision makers, to the politicians. Because if the citizens don't demand action, it's very easy not to take any action forward. And I think the big challenge on getting the citizens on board is not the ish existence of uh, of the um, of the solutions. I think it's really about. Uh, the uh, the competitiveness which with other topics now citizens are, they are concerned about the war about the energy and yes. they don't care about climate and climate adaptation so yeah. maybe when we work with the citizens we have to be more opportunistic so let's say for example over the last summer there have been some activities for example the Arsenal project which is one of the projects which works in our team they have been developing uh, activities on heat waves in Athens so it's a very clear topic it was very popular and people engage in this not only the stakeholders but also real people who are not engaged yeah. in the activities. So I think we have to change a little bit the emphasis of how we engage and how we work with the people. Excellent. Thank you very much, Guido. Great. Um, that brings me to uh, our last panelist um, um, for our panel here on the adaptation mission. That is uh, Sara Venturini. She's a climate expert at, at the group on Earth Observation, uh, an intergovernmental uh, group. Uh, and I, uh, if I understand correctly what you're doing, you are you are representing what I called the bridge in the beginning, namely the bridge between research innovation and uh, those that uh, hopefully make use of, uh, of that research innovation. So, Sara, maybe you can uh, come in and tell us a little bit about what is it that research and innovation will bring? How does that contribute to the success of that mission? Thank you and, and good day. Uh, yes, um, research and innovation are, of course, crucial for all aspects of the adaptation cycle. And uh, we can think about the, the planning stage first, where um, innovation in satellite technology or machine learning, for example, can enable the acquisition and the processing of more accurate data on climate impacts, risk and vulnerabilities. And this helps uh, better prioritize adaptation measures across sectors. Then when it comes to implementation, Early warning systems, for instance, are becoming more and more sophisticated, mostly thanks to innovation in uh, remote sensing technology. And they can now predict extreme events uh, such as floods or heat waves within 15 days warning instead of six hours or um, crop failure with a three month warning, for instance. And finally, uh, measuring progress on adaptation is difficult because it's a moving target, conditions keep changing, and it's a multi-dimensional problem that transcends uh, sectors and national borders. Therefore, the challenge to researchers there is to develop 
and agree on, on sound adaptation indicators that capture the complexity of the issues. And, and here, the increasing ability to collect and analyze uh, huge amounts of data of different types and scales is really transforming research in, in natural and socioeconomic sciences, creating this momentum uh, in advancing the monitoring and evaluation of adaptation actions and policies. And this is what we, we do um, at GEO. Great, Sarah. So you pointed out a couple of things uh, that research can help with uh, early warnings. It can help with um, monitoring. Uh, it can help. Uh, you are progressing a lot on data treatment uh, in general, whether it's for warnings or monitoring. Or so there is not only the solutions aspect, but it's also uh, the uh, actually the warning and 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 monitoring aspect, which come which comes in addition, and which uh, comes through research. Absolutely. And as I mentioned earlier, bringing science and environmental information closer to end users and communities is crucial. And we need to do this uh, fast. The results of climate change, uh, drought, flooding, wildfires are already uncomfortably close to citizens across Europe. But this information needs to be presented in a way that's actionable and and this is what we do at geo and we are delighted to have been selected as friends of the mission adaptation in june this year and as such we will contribute by sharing knowledge and earth observation based solutions with regional and local authorities and also through the the mission implementation platform which um, is a mechanism as i understand it that will support and coordinate the mission's um, activities so we we do help uh, provide our members and the broader community with the information uh, needed for the implementation of the Paris Agreement, for instance. Sarah, uh, you mentioned now a thank you very much. You mentioned now a very important keyword. You were mentioning uh, friends of the mission, and uh, you mm -hmm. on the f f f from my perspective, you are both on the screen here in front of me. I guess for the spectators, it looks different out there. But uh, you are, um, I, that gives me uh, an important message to pass, namely that in a couple of minutes from now, we will have a ceremony uh, for, um, uh, for those that um, join the mission as a region, as a signatory and as friend. Uh, and uh, Sarah, as you rightly were saying, there was already one of these uh, moments uh, in June uh, where um, uh, more than 100 regions have been announced and 20 friends of the mission and uh, today we do the same as we did in June in a couple of minutes and there are additional regions and um, and uh, friends of the mission will be announced and I so I will ask all of the spectators all of those who are listening and 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 and, and watching this stay on um, and uh, we will soon start with that but before that we have a little bit of time so that we can actually uh, also uh, um, have a little bit of a of a second round I was wondering whether any of you uh, wants to come in with what is maybe an important message that, or may, what is important that we haven't talked about, what we maybe would need to think of, or Guido, uh, maybe when you were a little bit surprised that citizen engagement was so low on this, what are you, why is it maybe so low? Is it the spectators that are more from the non-citizen part, or what, 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 what might be the reasons? I mean, I would expect, yes, the spectators may be. I mean, uh, this research and innovation day, so there might be many researchers, and often researchers feel more comfortable in their area, which is about knowledge, uh, than, than dealing with, this pe with people. I mean, uh, engaging citizens is not... It's there not are researchers thing. specializing in citizen engagement. I know, <laughs> and, and I think they are very important. Yes. I mean, at the end, it's not easy engaging people. I mean, we, with the, with the, within the four projects, we organize uh, workshops with the citizens, and it's very difficult to get them on board, to really... Uh, to be really engage them in the yeah. activities, we 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 are doing citizen surveys, and very often we end up only with the stakeholders because other th citizens they are busy with other topics and they really don't see this coming up. That's why I, I mean I think that's why citizen engagement was so so low on the list. But I think if we really think about how things change in the world, it's not only uh, it's not without citizens definitely. No, thanks, Guido. Anyone else wants to come in with any? Um important aspect that uh, comes in addition? Well, maybe, maybe this bridge uh, uh, that was uh, just 
uh, brought up uh, by uh, by Cheo, uh, the bridge between science and uh, uh, policy makers. It also involves uh, citizens' engagement and everything. But in order to to make the bridge, we really need to understand uh, where the gap is. And mm. uh, in my opinion, the gap is not. Uh, is not really in the availability of uh, science-based solutions, um, of uh, evidence-based uh, knowledge, etc. It's the gap is in the uptake, and we need to understand why uh, the policymakers are not uptaking it, why they are not deploying, why they are not using this knowledge-based. Uh, mm. Uh, evidence that we have and uh, knowledge-based uh, solutions that we have. And to me, there are three, uh, three points that, um, three bottlenecks that we need to tackle in this matter. And the first one is the, uh, sometimes the lack of uh, evidence that is context sensitive. Uh, being uh, for most of my professional life a, a policy maker, sometimes I can, I can say that the, the knowledge and uh, what we have there, the evidences are not contexted into the policy making. Then the difficulties, uh, and it was already uh, pointed out, the difficulties in accessing the existing solutions, the existing, the existing knowledge. So we need to turn the solution into information. Yes. And um, to bring this information through digitization, which we already have as technologies, to the citizens in order to engage them more and resolve this kind of challenge of citizen engagement. And last but not least, this is the um, challenge with the correctly interpreting this information. And sometimes maybe the science could be, the, the scientific community could be more proactive here and, um, and uh, look for uh, brokers. Uh, it's it's um, quite modern mm. lately to talk about knowledge uh, brokers, brokers. Yes. Uh, and it's, it's very important. The civil society uh, organizations could be uh, that kind of brokers. Others could be, um, you know, even citizens themselves could be this kind of brokers. So let's think about these three um, gap-breaking um, actions, probably. Mm -hmm. And, um, well, there are a lot of examples that could be brought, and we don't have time here, but I will just mention the uh, Horizon programs, for instance. This is really uh, an, excellent, um, an excellent example of what we are doing in order to uh, engage science with the policy making. And the two Horizon programs, so Horizon um, 2000 and then and now Horizon Europe, they, they have brought us solutions, they have helped us um, deploy the solutions, they have brought all these scientific solutions close to the public. So let's take of these good examples and Excellent. go ahead. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I, I, I see that Guido would like to say something, but uh, I was wondering, Audrey, um, I guess some of those aspects that, uh, that Svetlana brought up that rings a bell with you as well, no? You are switching between the policy maker world into the... <laughs> into the um, uh, administration world and, uh, and I guess the context specific and so on, you have also a stories to tell about that. Yes, I, I was agreeing because uh, uh, we have, uh, it's, we ha of course we have the solutions, of, of course we have the knowledge, but if you, you, you cannot um, copy one solution with, uh, which has worked in Spain uh, into Lille without uh, the context, as uh, it's, uh, Svetlana just said. And uh, this is important for the policy makers, the context and how to explain how the context can be different and how you have to adapt a solution and in, an innovation to your local uh, context. But maybe I could just um, um, uh, add that um, we work with the experts and scientists uh, also on local levels. Uh, we have in Lille what we call a, a Metropolitan High Council on, for Climate. Uh, there are four groups uh, in this uh, in this council. One 
with the, the, the towns. And as I said, we have 95 small and, and bigger towns and uh, with the policy makers. We have uh, one group with the um, uh, local companies and local NGOs. We have one group with the citizens and we have one group with experts and scientists. And the four groups are working separately and they are also working together and they are choosing um, topics, items, for instance, renewable uh, energies, how to make uh, renewable energies be accepted by uh, citizens, because uh, it's just like social housing. Uh, everybody is uh, agreeing on it, but no, nobody wants it in his backyard. So uh, I think this uh, dialogue exists locally between policymakers and, and uh, experts and scientists, and uh, it should not be forgotten. Thanks a lot, Audrey. Sarah, uh, would you like to say uh, something in addition to what we have maybe not yet, or comment on anything you heard just now? Sure. I have an additional point, if I may, um, on partnerships uh, with the private sector. Um, we, we believe that um, effective solutions need to be based on partnerships. And we observe that the emergence of uh, public-private partnerships especially for in our field for data procurement is creating a very disruptive uh, trend. Uh, private companies that are able to make big investments then uh, close the capacity gap and bring benefits in terms of technological progress. At the same time, the participation of government partners ensures that data are open are available at no cost to the users that and the communities that need it the most. Um, there are examples of uh, data programs where uh, free satellite data are offered to whomever uh, requests it. And um, these programs benefit citizens, but they can also be informed by citizens. Satellite observations can be complemented by real-time uh, bottom-up observations uh, gathered from citizen science and crowdsourcing initiatives or extracted from social networking activities and smartphones. Um, if you think about it, observations collected and, and transmitted from smartphones can really be employed for early detection of epidemics and outbreaks of um, climate-related diseases or for monitoring areas or, or people that are hit by disasters, hurricanes, floods, heat waves. So Earth observations are already uh, closing the, the data gap in this sense. And, and the main challenge for us now is to ensure that um, we continue to bring together partnerships with, which turn this data into trusted information that can really inform policy and decisions. And we can do this together through the EU mission on adaptation. Sarah, that sounds uh, really fantastic, and I thank you very much that you also brought up the uh, the private sector and the and the and the data um, maybe held or produced um, uh, by the private sector. And uh, you seem to have had uh, you were de describing positive experiences uh, in this regard. So I was wondering, um, insurance companies, for example, are also holder of uh, or big uh, in internet platforms are also holder of. Uh, of information that might be uh, relevant, and is it always going well, or it is uh, bet between those private actors and, for example, a a research uh, institution like yours, um, or that that are part in, in in your group, for example, or is there something we need to pay attention to uh, in the mission? Well, we like to call ourselves brokers of knowledge uh, because we are not researchers, we are not um, implementers. So what we do is to, in fact, connect the private sector, um, the governments, the researchers, and, and the beneficiaries for to create this partnership. So, so far, our experiences have been positive. Of course, we need to pay attention to um, certain aspects when, when private sector is involved, um, ethics, um, proprietary rights, and, and all that um, affects um, really citizens and their territories. Uh, but uh, I think it is manageable. Uh, we need to learn from positive examples. Um, I know of one, um, uh, an example that was implemented by the Norwegian government. It's called NICFI. 
It's a data program that has enabled access to, to free satellite data for tropical forests. And, and then these data are provided by a consortium of um, satellite companies um, um, that, that really give the data for free because the, the government is basically paying for the data on behalf of the users. And uh, it is a good example. Um, there are, um, uh, in fact, solutions that have been developed based on this open data that wouldn't be otherwise available because satellite uh, from private companies can offer higher resolution than uh, it previously um, was available. So it's certainly uh, progress, but we need to be um, careful. And Sarah, um, I, uh, I thank you very much. And I, uh, I have to close now the session because we will go to the ceremony. I wanted to thank all the panelists Great contributions. You have brought up many, many, many issues. And for me, there were a couple of new ones as well that we have to pay attention to in the mission. And that's what it is, is all about. And uh, I hope that all of you will stick with us in the coming years and follow and help us uh, bringing this mission to a success. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am, uh, I am very pleased to be here with you all um, to welcome a number of regions that have decided to join our adaptation mission. Um, we are celebrating them engaging with the mission, but dare I say more importantly, we are celebrating them engaging actually in adaptation to, to climate change. And uh, before proceeding, I would like to welcome the President of the European Committee of Regions, Mr. Vasco Alves Cordeiro. Without the European Committee of Regions support, we would not be here today. So I would like to thank you very much and give you the floor. Well, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here and an honor to, uh, to be here with you today. I would like first to thank Commissioner Gabriel for the invitation to participate uh, in uh, the research and innovation days in the context of the mission adaptation to climate, uh, to climate change. Um, my, my presence here uh, also uh, intends to be one more small evidence of the commitment of the committee of the regions with this project and with mission uh, adaptation to climate change. Um, uh, not only with the process itself, with the format, but also with the goals, the goals of helping regions to, um, and local authorities to become climate resilient. The goal of having a back best practice community of regions and cities and local communities, uh, also helping them to be climate resilient by um, by the time uh, uh, by 2000, uh, 2030. And uh, I would like to greet everyone that has uh, participated in the previous panel. It was very important to hear um, the perspective from people with the qualifications that the speakers had, how can we help regions and uh, achieve success in this, uh, in this endeavor. But I would like also on behalf of the Committee of the Regions to welcome the new regions, the almost 100 regions that are signing uh, to this mission uh, today. And uh, there is some aspects that I find quite impressive. In just three months, uh, it was first launched in, uh, in June this year, in almost three months, we had almost double 
the number of signatories of this, um, of this mission. Of course, I think this is a sign that regions and cities recognize the urgency and the emergency of uh, having um, a good approach, uh, a, 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 an approach to this challenge. Um, this year, we have witnessed all across Europe uh, what is happening, the situations uh, with uh, forest fires, with, uh, uh, can be the effects also of this climate uh, change. And every day in the news, we hear uh, that things are not getting better, things are getting worse. Uh, um, a word that impressed me very much was the words of the UN Secretary General that talk about the climate carnage. Um, so this is uh, this is a situation that I think the fact that regions and cities um, uh, are willing to join this uh, mission is also a sign that they recognize the urgency and the emergency we are facing. But also because I think they recognize added value in this uh, initiative, in this project, to help them tackle uh, this challenge. And I think it's, it's very important to have, I think it's fundamental to have regions and cities, local uh, and regional communities on board, local and regional authorities on board this mission. Not only because uh, we are closer in some areas that are competence of local and regional authorities to act and to uh, deliver in the ground the European uh, Green Deal and the climate adaptation strategy, but also because of other issues, I think it's very, very important. This challenge is not only a challenge of having the right me measures and the right policy delivered on the ground. This is also a fight for the mentality, for the spirits, for the conscience of the importance of this challenge. And local and regional authorities as the one uh, are, are the ones closer to people. Um, they can also, in this context, help to raise awareness of the importance, of the urgency to act and act now. So it is a great pleasure to see that right now the mission has already more than 200 uh, regions and cities uh, signatories, and I think we are in the in in. in moving in the right direction, moving forward. Um, I, I invite all regions and all cities to, to be part of this mission because the purpose is to serve uh, cities and regions and to serve our citizens. So I thank you once more for the invitation and I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you very much, President Cordeiro, for, uh, for your support, your kind words. And uh, I can only subscribe 100% to your words. It's for the regions, for the regional authorities, for the local authorities. They have the responsibility and the power to change things. We've been living a horrible summer in Europe, in the world, but in Europe as well. It doesn't only happen outside. And uh, it is only with building this community of practice, which um, glad to announce today, which is now reaching 215 regional authorities and local authorities who have declared joining the mission and who are active in adaptation. But also I would like to welcome 40 friends of the mission, because these are these other actors without whom we cannot proceed. These are business, research centers, um, citizens' uh, uh, initiatives uh, that we need to bring in to shape the future, to shape the solution in which we want to live. So this, this, uh, this community of practice is growing and is a community of practice where one learns from each other, one supports each other and um, spreads the good word and more importantly uh, invest in what we are committed to be, which is a resilient continent. So thank you very much to all. Thank you to all these regions and cities who have joined us. Thank you, uh, President Cordeiro. And um, stay tuned, because at four, we have a very interesting session where we will be seeing what are the synergies between the mitigation cities mission and the adaptation cities and regions uh, mission.
Thank you very much.